Well, welcome, and thank you for coming. I do know many of you, but many of you are new faces. I'm Elizabeth Howiak, the International Mission Coordinator with the World Mission Ministries Office here at the Archdiocese. We are so pleased that all of you could join us this evening. World Mission Ministries and the Global Mission Network of Southeastern Wisconsin have been working together over the last few years to make mission in communities here and abroad come alive to explore new frontiers in mission in the 21st century for all people in southeastern Wisconsin to be energized in living our call to mission in global solidarity. Many of you may not be familiar with the Global Mission Network as it is a newer group, but I'd like to just take a quick minute to introduce this group to you. The Global Mission Network is currently comprised of various representatives from parishes, schools, and lay mission organizations throughout Southeastern Wisconsin. It is a new collaborative, only begun about two years ago. The network's goal is to motivate individuals, families, and faith communities to affirm, strengthen, and energize our universal call to mission beyond our borders. We assist with communication, education, needs and resources to deepen our personal and communal identity as members of the global community. You will have a chance at the end of the evening to visit the network's table in the back, back there, Rob, wave your hand, to find out more as we encourage all of you to get involved. It is your network and we look to you to help it grow. Tonight, we've invited you here to explore with us one of those new frontiers in mission in the 21st century, our call to care for all of God's creation in a world that seems to be so caught up in its destruction. We understand that our call to carry out God's mission to bring love, justice, and compassion to our world does not only include reaching out to our sisters and brothers, but extends beyond to see the air we breathe, the water we drink, the animals that swim in the sea and roam the great plains, and all the cosmos as one, all connected, all an integral part of life. Before I introduce our wonderful speaker, I'd like to take a moment to begin our evening with a short prayer and a few logistical points. We hope you've all helped yourself to some wonderful treats back there, all made by members of our Global Mission Network and friends, so thank you to them. And there's also some apple cider as we're feeling quite cold in fall today, and some decaf fair trade coffee. So please continue to help yourself throughout the evening. If you do need to use the restroom, of course there's not one right outside the door. So the quickest way is actually to exit through the back back there, make a right down the hall, and you'll see a sign that will direct you just to the left. So that's the fastest way. All of you have at your seats A little prayer, if you could all take that out. I will read the front, and then together we can all read the back. And this is something please take home with you. To care for the earth is to share with God in the act of creation. Together. God
international financial institutions in the global economy. The group provided resources for a nationwide network of grassroots organizations. Since 2006, she has been working on issues related to the looming ecological crisis, offering presentations, workshops, and retreats through her project, Spirituality and Ecological Hope, sponsored by the Center for New Creation. She returned to her hometown of Milwaukee in 2008 to continue that work. Her second book, Living Beyond the End of the World, A Spirituality of Hope, published by Orbis Books, addresses connections among the various environmental, economic, and cultural trends that are leading towards ecological collapse. This book is also the basis for one of the Just Matters modules sponsored by Just Faith Ministries, entitled Faith Encounters the Ecological Crisis. We also do have copies of Margaret's book available on the back table for all of you to take a look at later this evening. Currently, Margaret writes, edits, and maintains a website for this project. The address is ecologicalhope.org. She is also author of the blog, Swedish in Milwaukee, offering information, commentary, and reflection on key issues fueling controversy and protest in the state of Wisconsin, many of these environmentally based. So Margaret, thank you for being with us, and we give you a warm welcome. Unless we decide to act, 
so as to reverse a bleak and harmful future for millions of people. This places the ecological crisis in a wider intergenerational context. <clears throat> Hitherto, the understanding of environmental problems caused by human activities was related to local events. For example, pollution of rivers, deforestation, exhaustion of fisheries or landslides, for example, down the coast here, <clears throat> set off by interventions on the territory. The damage was done locally, and the remedy, it was thought, should be applied equally locally. Water treatment, forest regeneration, etc. Now, however, climate change and ozone layer depletion show a new phase to the ecological crisis. Local actions have a global effect. The whole planet is under threat, and only a response from all can be really effective. The ecological crisis also challenges our faith. It is the very dream of God as creator that is threatened. It is the entire world, the one God put in the hands of humankind to keep and preserve, which is in real danger of destruction. This is not an apocalyptic message, but a very real possibility if we stick to our business as usual attitude and refuse to act with conviction, conviction and strength. And then they make this remarkable statement, the first victim is the earth. That's pretty amazing. That's a pretty amazing statement. So what I'm talking about tonight, what we're going to be looking at, is precisely how the dream of God has been threatened. I mean, sometimes I think I'm being stark and bleak, and then I read things like this and say, well, at least I've got a company. <laughs> now, this is not a new concern for the church. I want to read this quote. Some, for some of you, you may recognize it. Guess who said this? How can we ignore the imbalances caused in the biosphere by the disorderly exploitation of the physical reserves of the planet, even for the purpose of producing something useful, such as the wasting of natural resources that cannot be renewed, pollution of the earth, water, the air, and space with the resulting attacks on vegetable and animal life? All that contributes to the impoverishment and deterioration of man's environment to the extent, it is said, of threatening his own survival. Finally, our generation must energetically accept the challenge of going beyond partial and immediate aims to prepare a hospitable earth for future generations. Guesses? It's Pope Paul VI in 1972. In 1972, He's writing about the threat to our own survival because of environmental degradation. Then we fast forward a few decades here, and we find the current Pope, Pope Benedict, saying this. This is from a question and answer session with some priests in a, a diocese in Italy where he was vacationing in 2007. Today we all see that man, I'm sure the Pope sees such language, but what do you can do? Today we all see that man can destroy the foundations of his existence, his earth. Hence, that we can no longer simply do what we like or what seems useful and promising at the time of this earth of ours, with the reality entrusted to us. <clears throat> On the contrary, we must respect the inner laws of creation of this earth. We must learn these laws and obey these laws if we wish to survive. Consequently, this obedience to the voice of the earth of being is more important for our future happiness than the voices of the moment, the desires of the moment. In short, this is a, this is a first criterion to learn, that being itself, our earth, speaks to us, and we must listen if we want to survive and to decipher this message of the earth. So across four decades, at that level, I remember popes have access to some great scientists there in the back. They're hearing about this all the time. And we hear this level of alarm, this kind of language. And I guess my question will forever be, when does this trickle down to the masses of the folks who are in the pews? Because the voice of alarm is very clear. We're in trouble and our survival is at stake. So, we'll run through some images um, really quickly. When I was born, uh, I mean, why, why are we arrived at this crisis? Mm -hmm. I mean, part of it for me is that I think 
half the time I'm walking around and stunned by what's happened in my one lifetime. But then when you think about what's happened in this one lifetime, I was born in 1949, and at that time the global population was 235 billion. And as you all know, we just recently, the UN was celebrating, sort of, the fact that we've arrived at 7 billion people. Now the thing about this graph that's really interesting, for those of you in the back, this will be easier. This is, this is 10,000 BC, when we are, you know, maybe 100 million people on the planet. And this is 1951, so this is right around the time that I'm born. And so, from 10,000 BC, so this is the 3 billion line, okay, 1951, this is where, when I'm born, it took us almost 12,000 years to go from 100 to 150 million people to 2.5 billion. And then it took us 60 years, a little over 60 years, to add, oops, to add, to add, to, okay, to add, <laughs> step it took us another just 60 years to add another 4.5 billion people on the planet. Now that alone should tell us that something's going to change, okay? Now, what, what have we done to sort of support this population? What we've done to support this population is we've, we've provided energy to feed people, to give them jobs, to churn out the, the goods made in the factories. And this, I love this photograph, it's a composite from, from NASA of the Earth at, Earth at night time. Just, just gives you kind of a sense of um, the spread of humans. And because it's light, so it requires energy, the light itself like this. And then, we grew up in the cities, and then when we, after the cities got crowded, we started moving out to the suburbs, and we started building developments like this, right? This was all happening in my own lifetime. I grew up in Wauwatosa, and when I was a kid in Wauwatosa, I lived on a dead-end street. Uh, it was called Jackson Park Boulevard, uh, just off North Avenue, right? So a lot of you know this neighborhood. And the dirt road started at Highway 100. There was a farm right there. So, I mean, again, this is just a phenomenal urban sprawl when you think about it. This is an area around Oconomowoc Walk where we've had fantastic sprawl going on. This was once farmland, okay? I mean, this is, this is what we've been doing. We don't think about it a lot, but this is what we've been doing, right? He, he always looked at an iconic image from Los Angeles, right? But again, we see this now everywhere. It, like, it used to be our special example that you could show this in cities all over the world now. So what does it take, what does it take to support all of this growth and development of my gen why are we having this problem? I have to just stand. <laughs> With, um, why are we having this problem? I mean, what, what has fueled this growth since World War II, the big industrial expansion uh, since World War II? We built dams, we needed power, we needed energy to fuel this. So we built these enormous dams all over the place, changed waterways and the flow of water all over the country. And then we took beautiful mountains like these in Appalachia. This is a very hard one for me because I spent a lot of time hiking around.